how can I be the best recovering addict ever? Right. I started out on that foot of not really ever telling people how I truly felt, uh, what was really going on, because I felt like if I wanted to get high, then I must be doing something wrong. Or if I was having some bad feelings, I must be doing something wrong. Like something was missing in my recovery. And I couldn't tell anybody that there was something missing in my recovery, because then what, what kind of recovery person would I be if that was the case? So it was just a really hard thing of entering into this recovery and feeling like I couldn't really be myself and I was still living my life for everyone else and who I felt mm -hmm. like everyone else wanted me to be. So today we speak with Jennifer. Now Jennifer has 17 years clean. Drugs worked as a social lubricant for Jennifer because she craved attention as a young age. Eventually she becomes addicted. Through her addiction she starts to wonder how long she can actually live this way because she sees her death in her future from her addiction. She goes to rehab and restarts her life, and she actually wrote a book about it. So uh, today's episode is uh, about families and someone that is a resource in order to help families dealing with addiction and some of the trauma calls from you know, the other members in the family as well. So this is another resource for people to use. You can reach out to Jennifer. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share if you enjoyed this episode of Chopping It Up. Yeah, sure. Let's go. Kind of, okay. It's kind of hot though, isn't it? <laughs> It'll get a little. It's fine. It'll get a little hot. It's definitely it's a little fine. hot for headphones, but but it is what it is, <laughs> it man. It is what it is. So welcome. I, I I can't believe you drove so far to come and do this, dude. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to be here, and it's been. I'm grateful for the opportunity right. to drive so far and come awesome. and do this. Dude, and I don't I love think it's that. that. I don't even think it's that far because I live in the mountains of North Carolina. Okay. So everywhere I drive is a little. <laughs> <laughs> far right. so i'm like this is this is not bad at all okay. for me so introduce yourself tell us a little bit mm -hmm. about you tell us why you wanted to come on yeah well i uh i'm jennifer manili and a little bit about me i have i just celebrated 17 years clean congratulations thank you man, in april yeah yeah it's a little little wild and uh i think in terms of um wanting to be on and stuff i think that was my ex-husband who mm -hmm. you may be familiar with mm -hmm. is eric fravel mm -hmm. he uh he hit me up and was like hey why don't you come do this and i was like okay sounds interesting let's it sparked go some interest <laughs> when he said that oh yeah sweet <laughs> yeah sweet so. so 17 years clean clean mm -hmm. from what um well we we were doing a lot of like cocaine and heroin and crack and uh my, my favorite, ironically, which is not a lot of other people's drug addicts' favorites, which is marijuana, was my always my favorite. But we were doing all sorts of everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that that was a experience to say to say the least. So clean from marijuana now too, or do you Oh use... yeah, no, I don't use I don't use anything. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in full support of people that feel like that's part of their journey. Okay. Uh, but for me, it's been a complete abstinence uh, base just because it's uh, that's just been my journey. It's been what works for me. I know me. I can't do anything in mm -hmm. moderation. Mm -hmm. I still have to be careful with certain little uh, things like not taking too much Advil or not taking too much, mm -hmm. you know, like cough medicine or Benadryl or anything like that. I have to not even... Uh, approach so I don't think that marijuana can be a part of my journey but so and also it's like uh, it was one of your favorite things too right it, exactly so it exactly it was no and when I was using it um, it was an all day every day thing I mean I'd wake up in the morning I'd do it all day until I'd crash at night uh -huh. and I couldn't not do it so and it always kind of also led to other things for me right. as well it was like there that was kind of the foundation of everything and then we'd put so much on top of it <laughs> as okay, well okay. so so what led you like how old were you when the first time you smoked weed what was the first drug you did oh man well the first drug i did well alcohol i drank a little bit i was probably 15 i think the first time it was such an embarrassing story i think because i was probably 16 years old when i first did pot and I was actually with some friends who were used to doing it, and they did it with, um, uh, they were doing bong hits. Mm -hmm. And I had never done bong hits right. before. They'll get you. But they were doing, and it was not a small bong either. 
So I did a few hits of that, not knowing anything. And they're like, well, this is your first time. You probably won't get high. And so uh, I did it. And then I met up with some friends afterwards with them. And I was so high. We were out in front of a restaurant. And we were waiting to get a table to eat. And I couldn't hold my together. And I ended up puking in front of everyone. <laughs> uh at this restaurant and they had windows like other people that were dining inside there were windows and they could see me doing all this i was so high i didn't know what was going on right. and uh so that was my first time getting high and i swore i was like i'm never going to do that again mm -hmm. obviously that's what we say right mm -hmm. it was such a terrible experience and yet i was like well Maybe I can just learn how to do this better. Right. <laughs> and so then I kept doing it. And, like, why? Why do you think that was? Um, I think some of it was because I was hearing so many other people talking about how great marijuana was. So mm -hmm. I was kind of like, I must be missing something. I must not be doing it right. So I just have to find a way to do it right. And if I find a way to do it right, then maybe I'll enjoy it as much as everyone else says that they right. do. And then I did. I figured out how to do it right, I guess. Right. Quote. Quotes right. <laughs> around right. that. But Peer pressure from friends to try it or just because you wanted to be? I really had this, this huge desire, especially in high school, um, to want to be accepted, to want to be the cool kid. Uh, I, was, I was a little bit of a jock, but I was also... I was an awkward kid, um, and I hung out with everybody. I was a chameleon, so I didn't really fit, feel like I fit in anywhere. And so I'd hang out with the not popular kids, with the popular kids. Like every every clique you can imagine, I'd had some friend in one of those cliques mm -hmm. that I would go and just jump around and hang out with. But so that also meant that I didn't really feel like I belonged anywhere and I wanted somewhere that I belonged. And so if I could be the cool kid that could do all of uh, these things and be the expert on how to smoke marijuana, uh, then maybe I could be the person that would teach other people how to smoke mm. marijuana. <laughs> right. Then uh, I would feel like I belonged somewhere. Cause it was like, that kid that taught you was the cool kid, right? Right. I yeah. looked up to this this person. I don't like, think wow. I ever saw him again, but he was older and he was a friend of the my friends that I was with. And uh, yeah, so I kind of looked up to him, even though I never saw him again. I can still almost picture him uh, from that and how like I felt about the whole experience around that. I was like, I want to be the cool kid. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely so, know what that's like. I remember yeah. being in school. Yeah. So how about childhood before that? How about your parents? How are those relationships? You know, I, I have an amazing, and I always have had an amazing relationship with, like, my mom. She is a single mother. I had, I got to be honest, I had a really great childhood. There wasn't too much going on, a few bumps in the road, some childhood stuff, but nothing that was really major. I had all of my needs met. Um, in high school, I went to, like, a private school in Charlotte, actually. Um, okay. So it was a really great childhood. Uh, there was a normal, I guess, kid stuff. My mom was working at a bank. Uh, she was a big banker at the time. Okay. And it was so normal. We went to church on Sundays. Uh, it just everything was... Maybe not um, perfect, but it it was about as good as it could get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so no alcohol, no drugs around you as a child. No, you know what? I have to this day. I have never seen my mom or my parents drunk. Hmm. Yeah, I did not grow up in that world. We were, I would say, we were about as waspy as you could get. Uh, growing up, it was. Yeah, there was nothing going on. And I think I think for me, even entering into recovery, that was kind of hard because I would hear other people's stories. And I was like, well, but that's not my story. Mm -hmm. I didn't grow up around right. alcohol or drugs or uh, knowing how to do all this. I've never seen my parents drunk. And so I kind of 
it was really hard getting into recovery, feeling like I belonged, especially because like I come from a good family, I come from a good home. Uh, and so that was kind of hard to rectify with myself when I entered into recovery mm -hmm. is how do I fit in here? Mm -hmm. So, right. Did you find someone that you kind of had similar backgrounds with that through that process? Through recovery? Yeah. No, I don't think so. Not uh, really? No, no. Um, pretty early into recovery, uh, the especially the first time, I was probably two months in, and I kept gravitating to people that I did connect with, people that uh, that did have hard backgrounds. But, like, Eric was someone I connected with really early on in my recovery. I think I had, like, two months clean when I met. Eric. Okay, and what age was that? Uh, I was 22. Okay. Fresh out of rehab. Yeah. And he was too. He was pretty new. So I kind of always make jokes when I tell the story because it was like, well, I had two months clean. And I think when I met him, he had like a whole six months clean. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was so much. And I felt like he had a sponsor and he was doing really well. And I felt like this was someone who was safe for me mm -hmm. and if you just ask him he'll tell you how wonderful he is uh so he was constantly telling me he's like i'm a really great person and and he is uh so i just got really attracted to eric at that at that time so right so he was on top he was on top y'all yeah. were doing well yeah he was doing well and i was just like this is someone that can I guess kind of help me mm -hmm. and guide me in my own Got recovery. Got more experience, a little more Got wisdom. Got more experience, a little bit more wisdom. He had, like I said, he had a sponsor that was also kind of helping guide me and all that stuff. And uh, I felt kind of connected. I was really scared because I was 22. I come from a good family and I'm thrown into the recovery world that is a little daunting uh, in general at first. And with a lot of people that I wasn't really used to being around, I was used to being around like college kids or or private school kids mm -hmm. and so i'm now i'm entering into a world that i felt almost kind of like i did belong but i didn't belong if that makes sense yeah, well, uh, a, part, a part of you could relate to those people but another part of you was completely separate from them right right like i exactly because it's like we had different backgrounds but at the same time we had this one thing in common which mm -hmm. was drugs right mm -hmm. and like i felt at home in that way i didn't mm -hmm. feel at home in a lot of other ways and but with you know hanging out with eric and a couple of the people the friends that i had made and like his sponsor kind of made me feel at home like they made me feel a little bit better about where i was and what i was doing and right. that i was doing the right things and they would you know tell me like you got to do this and i was like okay because i don't know anything i was just this 22 year old kid that really just didn't understand right. what was happening. <laughs> right. So. And up to that point, what it, what, what drugs had you done? Because you had just done any coke or anything at that point? I had done quite a bit of coke. That's what land, oh, landed okay. me in gotcha. rehab. Um, the, the first time was I was living with this guy, and uh, he was really kind of big against n not doing coke, but I, mm. was, I was smoking a lot of crack. I was working at a country club. So in that way, I kind of felt a little comfortable working in this country club because I was around people that I was used to being around because I kind of grew up a little bit in the country club world as well. Okay. And But then there was the staff that was more like people that either needed recovery or were in recovery at the time. And uh, so we were just getting high all the time, smoking crack in the bathrooms. Mm. Uh, in between, like, we'd be having, like, a banquet and then – um, there was like an upstairs where all the banquet stuff was. And then there was the downstairs where like the grill area was. So like your sandwiches and hamburgers and stuff. And I was working like in the grill and then we wouldn't have like a banquet up top. So we would go up into the bathroom at this banquet hall and go smoke a bunch of crack because no one was in there because mm -hmm. there wasn't anybody up there. It was just us down on the grill. And and um, eventually that caught up. But I, I all I had to do was go to work because they had like oxys at work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like the chef was dealing oxys and like the bartender was dealing coke. And like, you know, there was um, 
one wow, of the servers have get... like marijuana. Right. So all I had to do was just show up to like, work. Bro, I want to be at work all the time, <laughs> right? Like... Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. I'll be honest with you. And my roommate at the time, he had built a bar in our apartment. So all I had to do was go home, and he was selling weed. So between going home and going to work, it was just a constant party. And I mean, look, this may not be uh, something that a lot of people want to hear, but I had a lot of fun up until I didn't. <laughs> right, right. Right. So that's how it is, though, isn't it? It's fun till it's not anymore. Right. And I was smoking a lot of uh, crack, and things were actually becoming not so fun. My friends who were partiers, but they weren't partiers like me, mm -hmm. they were starting to get concerned. Okay. about me they were starting to so they were more like weird yeah weed smokers they were like alcohol. big drinkers and right. weed smokers but they didn't have to do it all the time and they would just come over and party but then the rest of their life was really normal right. mine was a constant party it was non-stop so uh yeah and they were just like jen don't you think that you should maybe like go a day without getting high and I remember one time I wanted to prove to them that I could go a whole day, a whole 24 hours. It started at midnight one night. And so I slept it off, whatever it was. We made this deal, go 24 hours. So I went 24 hours. And right at midnight, I was like, see, I am totally cool. I'm good. I don't need, I don't, um, I'm not an addict, right? Because... I went a whole 24 hours right. without getting high. Right. But as soon as midnight, 1201 hit, bam, getting high. How was you feeling during that 24 hours? Did, did you did you want to be using? Was you just proving a point? I was just proving a point. Right. I was like, this is kind of weird. But I was like, you can do it just to prove a point to get them off your back. And uh, But it was weird because I was at work, too. And I was having a hard time like at work kind of functioning without it. Right. And so... Yeah, and that kind of all, um, what what ended up actually leading me into rehab that time was the country club that I was working with, they changed their insurance provider. And when they changed their insurance provider, the new insurance company needed drug tests on file for all employees. They lost a lot of employees. I um, I but I was such a good employee for them that they came and I was really honest. I was like, listen, you know I'm not going to pass this drug test. Right. <laughs> like, right. And they're like, all right, what if we give you some time off, get clean your system out, and then come back when you can give us all we need is one clean drug test. It's all we need. We'll never ask you to do another drug test again. All we need is it that it's on file. And I was like, okay, cool. And I actually really believed that I could do that. But I had to go because I was smoking so much pot. It's like, you know, you have to go like 30 days. So mm -hmm. they were like, we're going to give you a month off. Right. And I was like, cool. And then I couldn't <coughs> I couldn't stay clean. Excuse but me. I was doing all this research to figure out how I could shorten that time frame. Right. Because I was like, well, I'm going to still smoke pot. I was trying not to do other things. And cocaine, I was like, well, that only takes like. A few days yeah, to get days. out of it. Yeah. So days. I could still do that the whole time, all the way up until I had to go give this drug test. So I was trying to do more Coke than pot. I was trying mm. to minimize my pot use mm. <laughs> and do more Coke because I knew I could. Right, I, I only could had to go like three system, days, right? right? <laughs> Let me turn it all the way over to Coke, then I'll just quit Coke for three days. I'll be good. It'd be good. Right. Right. Give them, a, give them a, and I was like, oh, maybe five days. Well, time, time came up, right? And... I had to ex ask them to extend a little bit of that time. And in the meantime, I was doing a lot of Coke and I was still doing a lot of uh, crack as well. Uh, Cause you know, crack is the same as Coke, obviously mm -hmm. it's just a different form. But um, I was having, I was starting to get physically like antsy enough that all the symptoms of what happens when someone desires crack was happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that was a, that was a really hard thing for me. And I didn't understand what was happening either with my body. So describe that, like what feelings? 
just that huge anxiety, like I wanted to throw up. Um, honestly, it's like if you want to clean your system out, want to go start smoking crack. I'd have to like I'd have to go sit on the toilet smoking crack because I was that anxious. It would just make me want to mess up. up. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. for lack of a better immediately, <laughs> immediately I was like, mm -hmm. oh my god, I gotta. You know, I got to yeah, go. Any uppers like that did the same to me. I remember uh, many times in a certain house we yeah. would get something and it was inside. Like, hold like, on, oh, I got to go. I got to go. I got to go right yeah. now. Yeah. Or yeah, it was like, does you know, you're trying to do the deal and you're so anxious during the deal. You're like, oh, my God. Like, can you please hurry? The right. Huh, no <laughs> shit. So you've, you've been sitting there and had that thought before, like, this Coke's making me got to go. Yeah, I got to yeah, go to the like, bathroom, we, we bro. Got, you got to hurry up. Hmm. Yeah. That's, 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 yeah. Uh, that's uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but that whole time period, um, you know, I was having people come over to the apartment. My roommate, again, he was really against, like, cocaine specifically. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to hide it from him. Uh, Cause I was like, well, it's not really none of his business what I do in my own apartment, and if he doesn't like it, screw him, mm -hmm. right? And so I was hiding it, but it, you can only hide things for so long before mm -hmm. he started picking up. He'd go out of town. What I didn't know was he'd go out of town, and I'd have the people that I was used to smoking crack with come over, and we'd smoke crack. But he'd have the neighbors like keeping him updated about what was going on mm -hmm. at the house, mm -hmm. right? And I'm like, you little uh, And so they would rat me out saying, oh, yeah, so-and-so. Um, so finally, it was like one day uh, I had been up all night, smoked a whole bunch. Um, he woke me up sometime in the afternoon, and he had he had the evidence. Like, he found the evidence of all of my... Coke. And I think I was being really defensive at the time, too, because he like woke me up asking questions. And I'm like, why are you asking me all these questions, getting really mm -hmm, defensive? Mm -hmm. And of course, then, that's what we do. right? Yeah. And then he started finding he was like, listen, you got two choices. You either got to get out or you got to go to rehab. Those are your two choices. I was like, well, I ain't got nowhere else to go. Mm hmm. Uh, unfortunately though, going to rehab and he was, he was cool about it. Cause I was like, well, I don't really want to tell my parents who wants to tell their parents, right. Mm -hmm. That they need to go to rehab. I didn't really feel like I needed to go to rehab. So you're totally separated from your parents at this point though. They, yeah, they, they don't lived, know anything about your usage. No, nothing, nothing. The only thing that my, my mom kind of knew was like, sometimes I wouldn't call her back mm. and she'd have to like threaten to get the state troopers out mm -hmm. on me. But she did not equate that necessarily to drugs. She mm -hmm. is just like, well, she's just living her life and not calling me back. We didn't have, this was, I was 20, this was 20 years ago. Um, we, it's not, we didn't have access to like social media right. and cell phones like we do now. We have cell phones, mm -hmm. but they were like the old kind of like flip phones. Flip phone, flip right. phones. Right. Beepers and <laughs> Beeper, four one one, right. nine yeah. one one. Yeah, so yeah. you know we didn't have the kind of access that we do now to people, and uh, so you know she's she's calling on the landline, leaving messages. I'm like I'm barely home, or I'm too stoned or too high right. to actually call her. So, but she has she doesn't know anything about what's going on in my life. But all of a sudden, I'm forced to kind of have to tell. And he's like, well, you don't have to tell your mom. You just need to go to rehab. And I was like, well, I can't. I really can't disappear for 30 days and not tell my mom. And how am I going to get to re? Like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't even know what this means. Mm -hmm. And so I, I did end up calling my mom. And I was like, listen, this is what's been going on. Uh, Steve is kind of telling me that I got to go. That was my roommate. And uh, I have to go to rehab. She's like, oh. And of course, my mom doesn't know anything mm -hmm. either. <laughs> right. She's like, like oh, what does that mean? <laughs> right, especially if you're talking about the way that you grew up and yeah. not using, so it was never really around your family but, or anything. Right, exactly. So I had no idea how I was going to uh, get from point A to point B. And there was this, you know, I love my mom for this. So there was this big snowstorm that was coming in the area when I called her. And my mom got in the car and drove 
what was supposed to be four hours, but turned out to be six. Her and my stepdad uh, got in the car and drove up to me as soon as I called them and just to kind of figure out what's our plan, what's our plan going to be? Because my mom is just one of those, like, we got a problem, we're going to go solve it, right. right? And, of course, I was really scared to tell my mom, but she showed up and uh, we got me into, like, a detox, uh, which I don't really think that I needed at the time, but I think with all the drugs that I said that I was doing, I guess the guy was like, you know, you need to go to detox. And de- detox isn't, you know, that was very different 20 years ago, too. Right. <laughs> I uh, go to this detox, and then I'm in there, and I don't, again, here's another situation where I don't really feel like I fit in. Mm-hmm. Because it was um, it was a state-run facility. So you do have your general, what I would consider, like, your old homeless like alcoholics in there. Uh, I was like the only female in there too. Mm. So I had the whole wing to myself. It was there was only like a handful of people. Now you can't go to a detox without right. it being completely full. At this time this thing was almost empty. There was only like a handful of us. Tons of beds empty. I had a whole they had I was um like I said I was the only female there. So I had a wing kind of all to myself had probably 10 beds in this kind of wing. Mm -hmm. Uh, All you had was to like separate, like was the curtains, kind of like a very hospital Mm -hmm. type thing. And, uh, but I had it all to myself. And then the guys had theirs. And then there would be like 12 step meetings would come in and I would go because you had to go to something like they kind of made you go to something. So I'd go to the 12 step meeting and I kind of was like, interesting. So some of these people are saying some of these things that I could totally relate with, right? Right, because when you come in, you feel like I'm on the opposite side of the spectrum. Right. These people don't have a place to live. They're Most of them are men, scraggy, right. probably dirty, right? Yeah. And then here you are, female on the other side, that has a decent upbringing. Right. But so, then when you hear the stories, it's like there's one thing that we connect to one. Yeah. I started seeing people that looked like me coming into the facility, right? And so, like, females, Mm -hmm. younger, uh, because if it wasn't, if I did see another female, usually they were, like, older. They were also from the streets, right? Like, I'm 22 years old. How am I supposed to see myself in in these mm-hmm. people like obviously i don't belong here's what i kept telling myself i don't belong <laughs> and so i finally started seeing people and it was the same when i went into rehab um a few days later i transitioned from where i was living i did end up going to rehab and i i didn't get the memo about when i was supposed to actually show up to the rehab but in my mind I was like listen you're just lucky I drove myself here (laughs) and so I drove myself the rehab was probably um I don't know maybe probably three or four hours away and it was in Virginia it might have been longer than that but it was in Virginia um Winchester and my mom had actually found it from one of her colleagues because she called some people up and was like, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do here. Mm-hmm. Where am I supposed to put her? What am, what's going on? And uh, she called around to the rehab. And the rehab actually told her, this is when I was still in detox. They said, well, we'll, we'll you, we do have a bed available, but your daughter is going to have to make the phone call. Like, we're, we only want people here that want to be here. And so she calls me back because she kind of wanted, she called the rehab up with the intention of, quote, kind of like booking me a room. Right, right. <laughs> exactly what I was just thinking. And they wanted to interview you. Yeah, yeah. Right. So so she's like, hey, I need a room for my daughter. And they're like, well, that's great, but we need to talk to your daughter. Right. <laughs> And uh, I think she got a really hard lesson because the guy that answered the phone was a little prickly. Hmm. And I, the first words out of his mouth when my mom was like, hey, I need to book a room for my daughter was, well, aren't you the good little mommy? 
Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it took um, my mom, I don't think, has ever been speechless in her life. Hmm was speechless in that moment. <laughs> you know, probably because of the people he has to deal with, though, right? Think of the, yeah. some of the people in the phone calls he probably gets. Oh, yeah, especially with the especially with the parents, right? right? Constantly having to run interference with the parents, to be quite frank with right. you. Uh, you know, parents trying to call up, how's my baby doing? Right, right. <laughs> um, I was talking to my son on the phone. He said, y'all are being yeah, mean to yes, him. Yes, yeah, 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 all the time because... What's up, guys? So we are packing up and we are leaving South Carolina. If you're enjoying this episode, man, don't forget to hit that like button. And YouTube has been demonetizing 90% of my videos. So if you feel like you want to give a super thanks or anything like that, that would really be beneficial. But likes are free. Comments are free. Let's start a conversation in the comments section about this stuff, man. I feel like we're not talking about it enough. We need more education. We need more people to know how addiction and trauma can shape your life. So uh, like I say, if you want to hit that like button, if you're not subscribed yet, I don't know what you're waiting for. A super thanks would be great. We'll see you for the next episode. You know, rehab is full. And this was this. What I loved about this rehab is a rehab that was run by addicts for addicts. Okay. Right. So, so much more identifiable that way, isn't it? Right. So there wasn't a whole lot of clinicians there. Right. And so uh, they really kind of honed in on just this is what we do this is how you stay clean very matter of fact mm -hmm. um and i i love that that piece of it and within that you have a whole lot of recovering addicts that get into the same building together especially early newcomers that are just fresh off the street most of the time it's not going to be there's a lot of emotions that are running wild in a rehab because of the nature of what the business is. It doesn't matter what rehab you are in. So you're going to get a lot of parents that are going to hear from the perspective of their kid that mm -hmm. wants to leave or there's these awful things because they have rules. Mm -hmm. They have got people and staff members telling you what to do and you got chores and like, what is this BS kind of stuff going on? So you got a lot of people that are like, I don't want to be here, F you, right? Like, you can't tell me what to do because that's kind of where we come mm -hmm. from is just that kind of rebellious lifestyle where we don't let anybody tell us what to do and it's a little rough. So, yeah, they had to, the rehab had to be used to running a lot of interference with the parents. So someone like my mom, which they're used to calling up and being like, I'm going to book a room mm -hmm. for my daughter. Mm -hmm. They're like. What a good little mommy you are. But it gave her a, yeah. a perspective and kind of a grounding in what she was really up against right. in that moment. I don't think she really totally understood up until that time where she, it's not that she understood from that, but she started figuring out that she didn't understand anything at all. That there's no organization there, right. to this. It's absolute chaos. It's absolute chaos, which is not what my mom is a fan of, mm -hmm. right? But... Uh, so I did end up talking to the rehab myself, which because I had no really choice in the matter. I'm right. kind of just doing my thing of going, I'm just going to do this until because this is my choice. It's the best alternative that I have. Do I need it? I don't know. Um, but I'm going to go do it because I don't have anywhere else to go. And uh, so that's where I went. And that was it was a really scary um time but it was also a pretty cool time as well uh taught me a lot about myself taught me a lot about like a little bit more about who I wanted to be they kind of tell you this is how you live your life without drugs and I'm like cool because I don't know how to do that and um but I still kind of had that I wanted to be cool I wanted to be like I thought it was kind of like a competition you know so I wanted to compete with everybody. I don't know what I wanted to compete with. Mm. I didn't know how, why that looked like that, but I was like, I would um, go, okay, well, I have 17 days clean, so I'm further along and better than everyone that has 16 days or 10 days or one day, right? Mm. Or I'd look at my life and I'd be like, well, I may not have my shit together, but I'm doing a lot better than that person. Right. Right. And just constantly kind of comparing out 
wanted to be like a competition. That was kind of my mentality was how can I be the best recovering addict ever? Right. And so I started out on that foot of not really ever telling people how I truly felt. Uh, what was really going on because I felt like if I wanted to get high then I must be doing something wrong or if I was having some bad feelings I must be doing something wrong like something was missing in my recovery and I couldn't I couldn't tell anybody that there was something missing in my recovery because then what what kind of recovery person would I be if that was the case and then it was right but it's it's not about perfection right correct right you didn't i learned that, that then. <laughs> i didn't understand yeah. that then right um that that's a that's for the future um but yeah so it was just a really hard thing of entering into this recovery and feeling like i couldn't really be myself and i was still living my life for everyone else and who I felt mm -hmm. like everyone else wanted me to be. You're still, uh, it was that popularity contest yeah, at school. Exactly. You still wanted to be in the yearbook as most popular. A absolutely. And so I did everything. If someone needed a ride, I'd give them the ride. If someone, I had no boundaries. I was mm. such a people pleaser. Mm. No boundaries. I do everything for everyone. Copper resentment when I couldn't get anything back, right? That kind of uh, life lifestyle expecting something expecting back when you're doing something. everything but not necessarily saying that you expect right i was exhausting myself and i lived that way for you know quite quite some time and of course you know eric enters the into the picture as well um with with the meeting him at two months and <sighs> He was a it was an interesting uh, relationship trying to, you know, be clean with with him and dating him. And of course, I don't know how to like date in recovery either. Uh, well, they say you're supposed to get wait a year, right? Ain't that like that's one of the, a, that's one what of they the say? Rules, I don't I, know a whole lot of people that do that. Yeah, I, I always laugh at. I thought it was ridiculous, yeah. but when you understand how emotion can be a trigger, it, absolutely, that's, that's the reason. Well, and I think I think that is, um, I think eventually people need to learn how to have relationships in recovery and how to get through it clean. And um, I think they say that because it's like, well, you need to really start learning who you are, not learning who the other person wants you to be or trying to figure that out. And so I think it's a good idea. I just don't think that I don't ask my sponsees to do that um, because I think it sets them up for failure mm -hmm. and because they're going to do it. And uh, what I do say is you can do whatever you want, but you have to be willing to accept the consequences and relationships are rather painful and that's fine you just have to understand that they are painful it's going to be hard and we hope that you get through it clean right and i can help you but you have to be willing to talk and communicate with what you are experiencing and you're going to make it harder on yourself but i fully support you in whatever decision is that you need to make mm -hmm. for yourself <laughs> so how many sponsees do you have right now i have um i have three active I think right now, um, I try not to take too many on at any one given time. Uh, I think I have a few floating around that may, they, I, I'm like, I don't know if I'm your sponsor, sponsor right. or not because you don't not, hardly call. No, you're not communicating <laughs> right. But I have three just like really active people right now. And then a few that I think say, do you have a sponsor? Yes, I do. It's, you know, Jen and so how long did you wait from like your clean date till you started sponsoring people well that's a not very long because Winchester at least what I was getting clean did not have very many women with a lot of clean time okay and um now I don't even, I think I may have attempted to sponsor a couple of people briefly the first time I tried to get clean when I, you know, met him, met Eric before I was married to Eric. Um, uh, and, but that didn't, we kind of started separating from the program pretty early on, but it was very encouraged to try to sponsor people 
especially if you're a woman that had any kind of clean time. Mm, just because there was no Just because there was room. really no... There was a couple of women uh, that had a lot of clean time that were always full of sponsees but mm -hmm. would continuously take on because mm -hmm. there was nobody else. So if you had, I mean, even like a year clean, didn't matter what step you were on, just if you had somewhere around a year clean, they were like, you got to start sponsoring people because... We need you. Um, so it wasn't very long. Uh, I hadn't worked a whole lot of steps. And I learned a lot about how to not be a sponsor mm -hmm. from that experience. Mm -hmm. uh, later on, uh, when when I did end up going back to rehab and I got clean and I was in, uh, I was still in Winchester. I got a year and I was sponsoring people and I'd look around and I'll be honest with you, I was kind of sad because I had a year clean and there would be rooms that I had the most clean time in, in that area. And I was like, man, this is not always, but sometimes I was like, man, I only got a year clean. Like what's going on? And I was sponsoring people, which I don't know if I should have been because I made a lot of mistakes along the way. Um, and then I, it was actually when I moved to Asheville uh, North Carolina, Asheville, North Carolina has, um, I was like, oh, like I'm going into rooms where you have quite a few women, quite a few men, quite a few people in general that have a lot of clean time. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, so that's what that looks like. <laughs> um, of Instead course, of you leading the conversation with the experience, now there's 20 years clean. Yeah. Instead of just a lot more. Year a lot more experience, mm -hmm. um, a lot more wisdom. Uh, so and that, this isn't to say anything about, you know, bad about like Winchester. It just was my experience at the right, time. Right. I mean, it is what it going is. Going into it's the room. Of, yeah. <laughs> like, and that's another reason for all this is spreading the word. Like it has come somewhere from where it was then, right? Yeah. Now we have more people yeah. able to help and people, you know, giving information, educating. Yeah. Because I don't think we're taught enough. I don't think we know enough. Like, even in your situation, if you would have known about drugs as a kid, this was an education yeah. program that you would have been taught. This is what fentanyl does. This is what cocaine does. This is like, education so that they can make a, a legitimate choice, right? Yeah. I mean, we educate them about jobs. We educate them about all those things so they can make choices. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and that was it. And, of course, you know, I'm very blessed that, uh, I got out of using drugs before fentanyl hit the streets because mm -hmm. I don't think that if fentanyl was around that I'd still be alive. So I'm very grateful for that piece. So I'm mm -hmm. still learning even for myself uh, the dangers of like fentanyl and so many of my friends have mm -hmm. died from fentanyl. And I'm just, uh, you know, obviously I'm not grateful for that, but I'm grateful that I'm not using because I was like, I wouldn't be alive still if if like we were using and um, cause a lot of my, a lot of my like heavier use was with Eric. Um, and he, he got to, I guess, I don't I won't say train, but he got to show me a lot of things, which honestly I'm pretty grateful for. <laughs> I know that sounds weird, um, but I'm really grateful for that experience about um and the depths that we went to for myself because it made me who I am today as well. Uh, it taught me a lot about who I am and what I'm capable of and going, well, what do you need to do to not be that person, right. um, to not feel that way that you did, uh, like when you were using and stuff. So um, very grateful for the experience, very grateful for where I am now as well. Uh, and being the person that I am now and being able to grow from it. Because there was so long, even when I had, the first time I tried to get clean, I stayed clean for about a couple of years. Uh, I still did not know who I was. I still had a hard time figuring out, um, you know, what I wanted to do with my life. I still didn't have a future I had envisioned, right? People are like, well, what do you want to do? I was like, I don't know. Wake mm -hmm. up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wake up, go to work. Um, be normal. Be normal, right? And uh, 
so it just gave me so many gifts to be able to learn so much because I, I was forced to have to learn who I was. I was, because it became life and death for me. And it was like, I got clean the second time. Um, I remember when I got clean the second time, I walked in to rehab and I'm five, six, and they weighed me in at 107 pounds. Um, and I could barely form sentences, uh, hadn't been sleeping all that much. And I was happy. I was so happy to be there the second time. The first time, not so much. The second time, I'm like, this is a gift. This is a gift to get the opportunity to put myself back together again. I didn't know if I was capable of staying clean. I didn't know if I wanted to stay clean. I didn't know. Um, there was a lot of unknowns about that time period, but I did know that I was like, well, for today, I am grateful to be in this bed, um, at, in this rehab and get to wake up. That's what I'm grateful for. <laughs> so, so things have come to a head. Like how was it right before the rehab? Like what was it that made everything, what made you say I'm done? It was, for us, it had gotten pretty bad. Um, I think, I think Eric still had, you know, listening to his podcast lately with you. I'm like, well, he still had a lot of things to have to figure out even beyond, you know, us. But for me, things had gotten really uh, bad. I had lost all the weight. I did not have a job. We were getting ready to move into his parents' house. And um, it just wasn't really a life. Uh, I didn't know what I was gonna do next. Uh, the only thing that we had figured out was that we were moving into his parents' house because we lost the apartment. And um, so pretty much everything was going away. I had nothing. And I, at the time I kind of had suspected because I was at 107 pounds, I didn't know I didn't know exactly how much I weighed until I went to rehab, but because I was at that weight, um, I had suspected that it wasn't going to be a dramatic OD that was going to take me out. I kind of just thought maybe my organs were going to shut down mm. and they were just going to stop working uh, because there wasn't a whole lot left for me to lose um, physically before like my heart was just going to stop and or something was going to happen right and i was like well i think i only have about two weeks left of doing this right. before i just my body won't do this anymore that's what i was thinking like the night before i go to rehab because my mom had come into town and i was supposed to go meet her at, in dc which was not that far it was like an hour and a half from winchester something like that so she had come into town. I was supposed to go have dinner with her, but me and Eric had spent the whole day getting high. <laughs> um, and so I couldn't I couldn't put myself together that day to go meet her, but I was supposed to be in the car on my way to her to go meet her for dinner. And I ended up having to get him to call her and tell her some story about how I got in a wreck or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that I had popped a tire, hit a curb, popped a tire, hit a dog or something like that. Some crazy thing that sounds really good when you're doing it. So everyone's like <laughs> checking on you, making sure you're okay. And not even not even getting mad at you for having to like bell on the dinner. Just wanting to make sure that you are okay. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we got through that period of time, but there was still something really nagging at my mom that next day when she was supposed to leave to go home. Like her intuition was like, you need to go find Jennifer right now. And she's like, but damn it, I got an earlier flight home. I don't want to go like I can go home and go like whatever. But she ended up trying to come find me. And it was within that coming to find me. That everything kind of came to a head at that point because she still didn't know anything about what was going on in my life. My ability to fool my mom hmm. 
was mm. unprecedented. I mean, I'm like, how have I been doing this my entire life and you still haven't figured out right. that I'm just full of shit right. most of the time that I talk, right? Because she wanted to believe me. Everything mm. that I said was just yeah. so, like, sh you, you could say, yes, that's true, but she just wanted to believe me so bad. And I think it came from her just going, I don't want to face whatever the reality is. I don't, because then I have to do something about it. Right. And I don't know what to do, and I don't know where to start with that, and so I just need her to be okay. And so that was her reality, was that she lived in the, well, she's okay. Until this moment when she was like, I don't think she's okay. And even though I thought I had convinced her, she had tried to reach out to me, which unbeknownst to me, my cell phone had gotten cut off that morning. I didn't know that, but it had gotten cut off. My cell phone and my landline that I still had, because this was, you know, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, not quite 20, but a long time ago. And that had gotten cut off. And then she couldn't get in touch with me. So she's like, well, because she was just trying to check up on me. She drove all the way to Winchester to try to, she was on my apartment lease. So she just had to go to the leasing office and be like, let me get a key. Right. <laughs> and because she's on the lease. If you would have answered the phone, though, she probably. It, if I had, if I would have answered the phone, I could have talked myself out mm -hmm. of that situation mm -hmm. and we could have kept going. But she went into my apartment. As soon as she went into my apartment, I was over at Eric's house in Front Royal at the time. Hmm. Funny story. This is, I don't even know how this happened. Him and his dad had to stopped by our apartment in Winchester, which is 30 minutes away, to get something to go get the cell phone that we had left in the tow truck on the way back from Baltimore from one of our trips of getting heroin. Mm -hmm. And um, my mom and Eric and his dad met at the apartment when my mom was coming out of the apartment. And my mom just looked at Eric, and he, she's like, where is my daughter? And he's like, well, what's going on? Is everything okay? You tell me where my daughter is right now. So uh, she called me at um, his parents' house, and his mom answered. And she handed me the phone, and I heard my mom on the other phone, or on the other line. She goes, Jennifer? I just went into your apartment, and are you getting high? And she asked me the question. And at the time, I was scared, but she asked me, and I was trying to think of all the lies, of all the things I could do to get out. But I was like, I don't know what she saw in that apartment, because we had a lot of stuff in that apartment. And I said, and then I th was thinking about it, I was like, I think it's time to own, like I could either lie or I could start being honest. And I chose to just tell everything in that moment. I was like, yes. And as soon as the yes came out of my mouth, it was like a hundred pounds. I don't even know how many pounds was lifted off of me. Right. Because I knew it was over. I knew it. All the stuff that we were doing was ending. And I was so, I didn't even care how much trouble we were in. I didn't care if we were getting yelled at. I didn't care if they were disappointed. I was like, I may actually get to live through this. Because I, at that point, I didn't know if I was going to get to live through it. And I was like, I may actually be able to live. And uh, I was in rehab within like 24 hours hmm. again. Uh, same rehab and that's where it's like I oh my god I get to I actually get an opportunity to try like I get a choice now wherever my life goes I get to choose it um, and that's kind of how I have le lived my life to this day is every day I get to wake up and it's like oh my god I get to wake up and I get to live my life mm -hmm. and I get to choose mm -hmm. the life that I'm gonna live gratitude man yeah and it's been an amazing um journey i did get out of rehab and i did end up living still with um eric's parents and him
for a little while. Um, and I'm so grateful for his parents because I had somewhere safe to go. They were looking out for me. And, um, and then it was about six months in when I could notice that something was a little off with Eric. <laughs> I was like, Hmm. And I had all the same things that I had witnessed in other people of going, I'm pretty sure he's getting high, but I don't really want to face it because I don't want to have to deal with the fallout of what that means. I'm living in his parents. What does that mean about, you know, us living here at the time I was questioning my own, I was still questioning if I wanted to be clean or if like, if I did go down with, um, if like if Eric started getting high, this was a big reservation of mine. If Eric did start getting high again, would I go with him? Because mm -hmm. I'd always had kind of just gone along with him. I was like, well, what does that look like if I don't go with him? Um, I don't want to, anything to happen. Like, I don't want to have to face what that meant for our relationship. I mean, at this time, we're married. So I'm like, well, we're a married couple. What does that mean for us if he's getting high and I'm not? I can't do that. So I was just kind of ignoring it, hoping it would go away, mm -hmm. hoping I was misreading, you know, all the signs. And then there was, I remember there was a night where he took me to dinner. Well, we went to dinner. He didn't take me to dinner. We went to dinner. And then he started driving towards, we were in Front Royal, started driving towards Winchester. And... He told me that he had been getting high and that he was going to go get some stuff and he needed some money. And I was like, well, none of that sounds like a very good idea. <laughs> uh, but I was pretty upset. And I asked him to please, because he had put me in his car. Um, we drove separately, but I had left my car at the restaurant and I was now in his car and we were driving. So I kind of was like, a little bit held hostage and he told me what was going on and that he needed money and he was going to go get drugs. And I had that pivotal moment, moment, right? What was I going to do? This is like my reservation come, come to a head. What am I doing? And so I started thinking about the six months of being clean and like, I was starting to like be happy again. I was, I had gained some weight um, back. I was feeling healthy I had a job. Things were really going in my favor. I was like, man, I don't really want to lose all that stuff. <laughs> and and it was your work to get to there, right? It was a lot of work to get there. Building from nothing is never easy. Yeah, and I was like, man, I don't, I don't think I want to go down that road. So I asked him. I was like, well, can you just drop me off at the rehab? Because the rehab was, like, on the way, right? I, I was trying to think of a safe place to go um, because he didn't want to, like, have his parents know anything. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't just, like, go home without him because then it's like, well, then I'd have to, like, be lying to him. I didn't I didn't know what I was doing, right? right? And so... But you knew what right and wrong was. You right. Knew, you knew which way you wanted to go. You just didn't know how to get there yet. Right. So I was like, can you just drop me off at the rehab? I don't, I don't want to do this, right? Um, I don't want to go with you. He's like, well, I'm not going to let you get high. I was like, I just don't, I don't want to be around it. Like, I just can't, I can't do this. Um, so just drop me off at the rehab. Well, he ended up turning around and dropping me off back at my car. <laughs> Thank okay. God. And then um, I gave him, I put some gas in his car. I didn't give him money, but I put some gas in his car. I was like, do whatever you're going to do. And then I went over to, um, one of his other friends' um, house, because I couldn't go right home. And I went over to his friend's house and was like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what's going on. I don't know how to help myself. I don't know how to help him. And there was like a lot of, uh, there was just a lot of decisions to be made at that moment that I didn't fully understand and was really, really scared of the fallout. But his friend asked me one really important question, which was, 
what's in Eric's best interest? Damn, Damn your question. Because it kind of brought it all together of like, well, if I start lying for him, that's not in his best interest. If we keep hiding all of this stuff, that's not in his best interest. It's not in mine either, but it's definitely not in his. And so I had to do one of the hardest things, I think, to date that I've ever did, which was go to his parents and tell them the truth. And he ended up getting kicked out of the house. And that was a really, really pivotal moment in my recovery, though. And it was devastating at the same time. And it was really hard because now I'm living at his parents' house without my husband. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm living in his in-laws. And, of course, they were like, you can stay here as long as you need to stay here. And so that's, that's, that's what I did because I didn't have anywhere else to go. And he ended up going into rehab and um, ended up in an Oxford house. And uh, so I'd go visit him at an Oxford house. And I'm like, man, this is this is a really interesting life that I'm leaving leading right now. <laughs> Crazy how things turn out. Right. I mean. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm I'm hanging out with my husband at an Oxford house and I'm living with his parents. And um, of course, you know, through all this, I can't not talk about his daughter as well as a big part of this. I don't feel like I need to go into too many details, but she's definitely a part of mm -hmm. all of this. And a lot of where it's like, you know, she's a big factor in um, a lot of decisions. Uh, probably why I stayed even as long as I did, because I was like, well, I'm not leaving her. Because um, at the time she was, I don't know, five, six years old and um, getting older and uh, we had I, we had like a great relationship and um, it was awesome and so you know I'm kind of faced with trying to figure out how to make this work but also was taking steps back and looking at going what is going on how how is this my life right now even in recovery how is this my life right and uh, then some harder decisions had to had to come. Um, come into play a little bit and I had to kind of make a some hard decisions for myself when I had about um, a little over a year clean I had been living with his parents for six months I had no way out. I still didn't see the light at the end of the tunnel mm, okay uh, at a little over a year clean and I was like I don't think I could live this life anymore and uh, for for a lot of reasons um, and ended up leaving Eric, which was a really, really hard decision. Uh, and it didn't have anything to do with me not caring about him or um, I just didn't know. I didn't know how we were going to get through what we were experiencing. And there were some other things going on, too, that I kind of was picking up on that I was like, I don't want to have to face that either I'd rather just come out clean um, and uh, just face the fact that maybe we're not meant to be right. together right. Um, and and not make it a uh, tumultuous time period. I didn't want to argue. I didn't want to mm -hmm. fight with them. I mm -hmm. didn't want to have it be like a really uh, hard and um, – tough conversations right we still had plenty of tough conversations i just didn't want to have to uh face what he was doing either <laughs> you want to split civilly yeah as we want to split possible. civilly yeah i get it as civilly as possible and maintain some sort of decent enough relationship and you've been clean uh, ever since then been clean ever since okay. yeah yeah that second time into rehab i never went back i never mm -hmm. looked back um in terms of using had been clean ever since. That's when I moved. Um, after a while, like it just, my time in Winchester was done. My uh, parents were living out in Lake Lore, which is right outside of Asheville. So I moved into that area. Um, my parents, I have to say, were pretty happy <laughs> right. um, to have me back. And they said, well, if you go back to college, we will pay for your college. Nice. And um, 
I had attempted college before quite a few times, was never successful, but this time it was like I wanted to go back to college. I wanted to get the education, to get the degree, and to finish. And so that's what I did is I ended up finishing. I finally got through and got a degree, um, a bachelor's degree that only took me like 10 years or something to <laughs> to get. Uh, but it, it wasn't even so much about the education piece of things. Do I use the education? Not really. Okay. But what it taught me was how to set a long-term goal mm -hmm. and how to go achieve that long-term goal. And that was a great exercise for me to learn how to, um, all right, this is this is what I'm going to do. It was one of the first times I have ever had a future. I was like, well, I don't know exactly what I'm going to do out of college, but for the next five years, this is what I'm focused on, right? It was this this five years, and I did that, and it was awesome because uh, there was a lot of other people that were in college as well that I knew from recovery. So we would get excited when mm, we saw each right. other. I started feeling more and more like I was belonging back to that sense of belonging. Uh, when I got out of rehab that second time, I started having a very different perspective about uh, belonging. And this is why I think I'm so grateful about what Eric and I went through is I, for the first time, I started feeling like I fit in. I started feeling like I belonged because I was starting to look at myself very differently and I was starting to look at other people very differently. I I was no longer like looking at people like I was having to compete against them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or anything like that. I was looking at people like, man, we've been through some shit together. Right. <laughs> Maybe not together, but we've both been through some shit. Right. And we're so, still standing. And we're so we're mm -hmm. I was really focused on uh, focusing on the things that we did have in common and not so much the things right. that we didn't have in common. Right. I wasn't comparing out. It was like I was, I could honor our differences, the differences that we did have, and be grateful for our similarities too. So, But at the same time, not compare yourself and think yourself is right. better. Because as addicts, we do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Hey, I'm only a pothead instead of crackhead. Or yeah. I'm not a junkie. I'm just a meth head. Or whatever, whatever, right. whatever, whatever, whatever. Exchange words. Yeah. But yeah, I think, and there's a negativity to that in life in general, isn't it? Oh, like yeah. Like you look at people and you want to talk bad about them because it makes you feel good about you. Yeah. Because you can say, well, at least I don't have this, or at least I'm not that. Makes you feel better about you, whether you know it or not. That's why you do that. Yeah. So being able to not do that, it's taken me a long time to challenge myself to learn to not do that. And I still make yeah. fun of people. Don't get it wrong. Yeah. I oh, make I fun of too. Eric every day of my life. <laughs> well, he's pretty easy target. Yeah, he's right. He is. And we make fun of each other because it keeps us laughing. You know what I mean? Yeah. I feel like you got to laugh. Yeah, yeah. And it's and I think I think it's like a difference between being, you know, mean spirited about it and using it as mm -hmm. a way mm -hmm. to put someone else down to make yourself feel better. There's a difference. Versus like we're just kind of giving each other shit. Yes. Right. Yes. And it's like, you know, for me, it's like I don't really like put myself down or think of myself as better. Sometimes I do. Like when I'm feeling kind of bad about myself, mm -hmm. to be honest, even now, I have to catch myself and making sure that I'm not, you know, looking at other people. And I know something is really wrong when I'm starting to, even in my head, putting other people down mm -hmm. to make myself feel better or starting to do that comparing mm -hmm. thing. And I was like, oh, man, I got to got to really look at this and like remember where you came from. And right, I think comparing to ourselves the best way yeah. to go. And at least I'm not where I was five years ago, 10 years right. ago, two days ago, three hours ago. Yeah. Like as long as we're getting better than that, then we can compare ourselves. To yeah. That. Yeah. And, and I, ourselves accountable, man. That's the biggest thing, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I can still get really caught into like seeing myself as better than, especially because, you know, I, I have dedicated like my life into, um, now I, I focus a lot on helping other like families and parents of dealing with people like us. Like that's mm -hmm. my profession. Um, I love it. And I go out to a lot of like business, like networking stuff. So I'm hanging out with a bunch of normies all the time. I mean, these people are normal. And I'm like, 
look, <laughs> I tell them a little bit about myself. They get really surprised. But within that, because I can put myself and I feel like I belong just as much in that group as I do with the other group. But I have to be careful because I can start thinking of myself as better than like the other recovery people because I'm hanging out with all these normal people, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they're looking at me like a business professional and they're coming to me for like advice and, you know, all of this stuff. So I have to be really mindful and, and stay diligent in my own journey and also just kind of stay in my lane. Also remember like where, where did I come from? Mm -hmm. Right. What, it, what do I do? What am I capable of Man. to this day? Like people are like, Oh, like recovery people, they'd be like, Oh, you know, I can't even lie anymore. And I'm like, man, I'm still a really good liar when I want to be right. Mm -hmm. Like, let's mm -hmm. not forget. I have all of these things that I can still do really well. Mm -hmm. uh, manipulation, lying. If I wanted to steal, I steal. It doesn't make me feel good. So I don't do it. Right. And um, so I, I think that's kind of it, too. Right. We still know those tools are there. It's just do we choose to take them out? Right. We don't. I don't use those tools now. If you want me to be the main point person on planning someone's surprise birthday because you know I'm not going to give it away because, you know, I can lie my ass off. Mm. Cool. Mm. I'll lie my ass off to surprise. It'll be in benefit of mm -hmm, people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, like there's times where I think, you know, we kind of need to like show people a different way of looking at things. Some people may call that manipulation, but that isn't that what it is. Like we help people change their perspective on things and I can use that to benefit other people, too, because it's like, well, sometimes your perspectives may be a little bit. Have you thought about doing it mm -hmm. like this or right. have you thought about thinking about it from this standpoint? They're yeah. like, Oh, no, I haven't. This is really helpful. Right. And it helps them. Yeah. So we can be very as much of as destructive as we can be. We can be just as much of a benefit to other people as well with the same exact tools that we use for destruction we can also use to build people up, which I think is really important to say <laughs> uh, for all the other recovery people that are listening out there that may just be starting their journey is going, you can be just as powerful the other way as you are. You are good at things. Learn yeah. how to use those things in a, in a better way. Yeah. Same exact tools used in a little bit differently. Like you, we use a hammer, like a hammer is supposed to be used, <laughs> yeah. you know, so all right, pick the proper tool. Yeah. Gotcha. So what do you do daily now to stay clean? Is there certain things you do? Meditate, therapy, AA, NA? Um, I still do. Uh, I still go to 12 steps, not as frequently as I used to. Uh, I spend a lot of time. Um, I always have kind of in my life some sort of professional um kind of development going on as well as personal development, whether that be um, like I spend a lot of time uh, talking to like a lot of normal people about recovery, about what it means to be an addict, about what they can do to help other people because they don't know. It's amazing to me because um, we get into a bubble when we're in recovery. Yes. We get into a bubble. And we're we just surrounded think, by so many like minds that you don't understand that some people don't get it they, at all. At all, yeah. right? And so I spend a lot of time going out and actually talking to like a, a lot of normal people about this about this stuff, and that helps me mm -hmm. stay clean. Because one, it helps me remember, you know, where I come from, what I'm, what I do. I mean, I have. There was this um, one lady that in the professional setting, I probably ran into 10 times. She could never remember me. And she finally walked up to me the last time. She goes, you know what it is? It's that you don't look like an addict. You don't talk like you don't, you don't come across. Mm. Cause she used to be in that world too. And, um, but it's good for me, uh, to constantly be remembering that piece of my life, uh, because it teaches me about the person that I want to be, I spend a lot of time following other people, like probably one of my favorite people that I follow that helps me a lot in really discovering who I am is Brene Brown. Um, I think Brene Brown is uh, an amazing person. She's raw um, and she's helped me in a lot of my self discoveries with just her work. I've never met her. I've never gone to a conference. 
But just reading her books, I started a whole like international book club during COVID um, with Brene Brown, where we were meeting like weekly because COVID was really hard it, for recovery people mm -hmm. uh, because they lost a lot of the connection, a lot of that stuff that we in recovery that were like, these are the things that you got to do to stay clean. In COVID, those things were going away. So you started seeing a lot of people, even long term mm -hmm. people losing their recovery mm -hmm. idle because, hands man idle yeah hands. idle hands and so i was doing everything for me to kind of stay on top of it and so um uh brene brown was a big piece of of helping that because i would start virtual international um, book clubs and we would go through like her book and i felt like connected to the work i felt connected to um myself i had a lot of discoveries and a lot of getting connected with people all over the world because it was like, you know, you start getting like Zoom fatigue. But in this capacity, it was great because these were people I was getting to meet that I would never have otherwise met. People in the like UK, people in Turkey, people Australia. Mm. Um, I mean, just literally all over, all over. It was uh, amazing getting to hear different stories of like normies and like the cultural differences of uh you know the self-discovery uh mode and how it's the same across the board and this is where it's like man normal people suffer from the same stuff that recovery people yeah, do sure. it just doesn't show up in drugs mm -hmm. right but they still do i mean they're so messed up <laughs> normal people are so messed people up people in general man <laughs> yeah people in general. still struggling with the insecurities still struggling with some effed upness it just doesn't present itself mm -hmm. um in the drug use maybe not so much in the in the trauma aspect of things but they're still dealing with some of the same like challenging mindsets what i'm so grateful for what i think is a luxury of recovery is that we actually get to work on this stuff normal people have to live with themselves right. just the way they, they and are and they never really <laughs> understand that there's a problem to even work on yeah yeah i will take um a recovery person that is working on themselves man um they're the best people to work with to be friends with because they are making choices and learning how to be friends. They're mm -hmm. learning how to communicate. They're learning, or they've learned how to be trustworthy. Mm -hmm. You can, a recovery person that is, you know, living that lifestyle, they're not gonna steal from you. They're not gonna lie to you. Well, maybe they'll lie, but then they'll feel bad about it and they'll come and tell you the truth, right? Um, so it's like all of these things. Such a fine line between yeah. um expecting them to be what they were before and giving yeah. them the room to grow into something new yeah yeah and i you know i i think people no matter what um you know everyone has the right to change and i think that um we even as a society i think we should do a better job at allowing people the right to change right um and this is where it's like i go and i talk to normal people you know, I teach them like how to have boundaries with, with people like us, where it's like, we look at their behaviors, not at the people, right? Like we set boundaries with behaviors. Um, we don't identify people as good or bad or whatever. Uh, we just want to set our boundaries of, if you're gonna show this behavior, we can't have that. Because I think as long as we, if we're going around going, I don't like this person or this person is a shithead or whatever, we're not allowing people the right to change at that point because we're always going to write mm -hmm. them off as this is a person that I don't like. Mm -hmm. And in five years from now, if you're like, well, this is a person I didn't like in five years from now, why would that be any different? You know, it's it's like, well, why don't you give them a chance? So it's like, well, five years ago they were behaving this way. I mm -hmm. wonder if they're still behaving this way. Mm -hmm. And if they're not behaving that way, now you can maybe create a relationship with that person. And I've I've had that happen to me several times. People that were exhibiting behaviors that I didn't like, especially when they would first come in and mm -hmm. get clean and they're still living that lifestyle. I'm like, I don't like that person, right? But then they would show up in a different way. And I was like, they're different. They truly are different. They're mm -hmm. not living that life anymore. So when I stop identifying people as people I don't like or people you know I do like, it's like this person, 
is exhibiting a behavior that I don't much care for. And when that behavior stops, now we can maybe connect and be friends. Um, and that, that has been really helpful for me. It gives me um, a way of being able to come back to someone and really actually admire what they've been able to do in their recovery uh, and see them as like a solid person and a confidant and all of those things and um, uh, create an amazing relationship to someone that I had initially written off as going, eh, I don't like them. <laughs> it takes a lot to do all that too, man. Yeah. I feel like you've come a long way, dude. Like, uh, congratulations on like 17 years, a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It's, it's sometimes like I look, I'm like, I don't know how I have been able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, do you have things that trigger you daily? Do you ever have the thought of getting high? Sure. Um, you know, sometimes like on a really nice day, um, it's like, man, it's especially like if like a, an old school Jeep pulls up next to me, because this is one of the things that I love riding around in like an old school Jeep, smoking blunts or whatever, listening to Sublime. Um, it was I mean, that was just an amazing time. And it's like I still see that. And sometimes I'm like, oh, man, that's great. I would love to be able to do that. Uh, I still get like every now and then something I've worked. I've worked a lot on like my main triggers um, so that I'm not getting triggered all the time. Like spoons are for cereal and soup, right? Mm. So you got to work out like some of those kind of triggers, especially mm. early on. Um, uh, cer certain different things like Mario Kart used to trigger me. I think it still does that music and Mario mm. Kart because we played so much Mario Kart when we get high mm. that it's still like if I hear that music, it'll still. So one Get time we me. went and got like 15 bottles of butane, 15 years old, and three of us sat in huffing butane listening to Metallica, Master of Puppets, <laughs> and Creedence Clearwater Revival. And any of them songs, Susie Q, yeah. Susie Q comes on right now, it takes me back to a 15-year-old yeah. kid huffing butane. Yeah. There's certain things in those songs that my brain will pick out every single time for the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, sometimes, and I know this is... I don't know if I should say this or shouldn't say this, but transparency, right? Um, you know, like when Eric first, because we haven't really talked a whole lot since, you know, I left. Mm -hmm. This was, you know, 16 so years ago uh, when I left Winchester. I hadn't really seen him. And so when he reached out to me, like I just, I did, like I kind of had a little bit of a panic <laughs> going, mm -hmm. you know, because it just brought me right back mm. um, to that time period mm -hmm. because, uh, unfortunately, like, or fortunately, I'm not sure, but it just is what it is. Like, you know, Eric is equated big time with that time period of my well, life. There's still, there's still a fear attached to yeah, it. Yeah. Like, I'm not like afraid, like I'm going to sit here and, and go use, cause obviously mm. he's not using or anything like that, but it's just like, it brought me right back. It's in your blood. It's yeah. In your it's, genes, like... <laughs> it's in your memory. It's not something that's going to go away. Right. Right. But I also kind of started looking at this as like a very, um, healing opportunity right. as well, uh, to be able to come out here and see him. And I was like, man, this is, I probably, uh, maybe he wouldn't have been ready before I wasn't ready before, but it's like, now it's like, I can really see this as something that's very, you know, healing and uplifting mm -hmm. and something very productive that come out of something very destructive. And, uh, I think he's had a lot of time to think about some of the burnt bridges. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and when you come to nearly dying, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like he was literally scared of dying. Yeah. That's a lot to think about. Yeah. And, and maybe those types of things are some of the reasons he did reach out because I didn't know anything about talking to you. I didn't, I didn't know about your book. You know what I mean? He right. brought all those things up. So obviously that's something that was in yeah. his head. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, it is hard. Like I think for me, I got that fear of dying a lot sooner than he did. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I'm really grateful uh, for that in terms of I got it when I got it, right? And he's getting it when he gets it, right? And um, I think as we get older, we do kind of start really thinking about who do we want to be? Where do mm -hmm. we want to go? Uh, what, what am I leaving do? behind? What am I leaving behind? 
uh, all those burnt bridges is like, is that how I want people to remember me? And yeah. it starts kind of getting, starts kind of getting to you mm-hmm. a little bit. Yeah. Uh, even now, it's like I still got 17, you know, 17 years clean, but I'm still thinking about, you know, what do I want to leave behind? And I think that's why I do what I do professionally now. Which is, is what? Like you haven't? Can you put a label on yeah, that yeah. for us? Yeah. So uh, I, like I said, it's not really a label, but it's it's I work with families, a lot of parents that do have loved ones with substance abuse mm-hmm. issues. Because um, I think that would have been really helpful both for my mom. I think it could have been really beneficial even for his parents when he when they were, like, dealing with us. I think it could have been really helpful because I think that all of our parents, my mom and his parents included, all they wanted was the best for us. Right. You know, they wanted to help us out so much, and they did so much for us. Um in some ways, I think it was a little bit too much. <laughs> right. Um, too helpful to the extent too, of, of, of too helpful. helping us use. But they were there. Mm-hmm. You know, they they were there and they really helped. I think they could have uh, they could have used some guidance, um, you know, and how to best be of help. And so, I'm like, that's what I do mm-hmm. now is I kind of help those those parents work one on one with people mm-hmm. work on one on one so that it's like. I know that all you want is to be helpful, so let's make sure that what you're doing is really in their best interest mm-hmm. and is is being helpful. And sometimes, you know, that's sitting on your hands and letting them just experience what they need to experience. Pain is a great motivator, mm-hmm. and when you take their pain away, then you make it too easy for them. <laughs> and uh, when you make it too easy for them, then they're just going to keep doing what mm-hmm. they do. Uh, they need that pain. Yeah. Uh, the pain is what creates... A different person yeah, and some parents can't sit and watch their kids go through that pain no they, they can't just can't i have i have some now that are 77 and 82 yeah. or four with a 46 year old son mm-hmm. and they just can't cannot, do it they cannot yeah turn it off they just can't yeah i try to like to get um the parents between the ages of like when their kid is like 20 to 35 much past 35, the parents, it seems not that, not always, there's always exceptions to that, but it's like the parents are just so ingrained in that. And still taking care of and them. And still taking care of the them. They can't break that turned habit. into a 30 year old that they've still been taken care of. Yeah. And it's like, if I can, if I can kind of help intervene before they've really ingrained some of that muscle memory of mm-hmm. taking mm-hmm. care of mm-hmm. them and break some of that mindset and help them get through. Um, I have worked with people where the kids are a little bit older, like 45. It is a lot harder and takes a lot longer um, for them to get to the point where they can be the parent that they need to be for that kid again uh, to grow up. Because that's essentially what we're doing is we're like, all right, you're still kind of parenting your kid. We now have to adult with our kid, Mm -hmm. and this is what adulting looks like, and that's what they need because as long as you're the parent, they're still going to be the kid, Mm -hmm. right? They have no choice. They don't have the tools or the resources, nor do they need to fix it as long as you are uh, stepping in and continuing to parent. They're going to continue to be the child. So if you want them to be an adult, we have to treat them like Mm -hmm. an adult. And this is what that looks like. And, and it's, a, it's, not a, it's not like a one conversation. This takes a while for people to really start implementing this foundation and these tools for them. Uh, you know, I tell people, it's like, I don't want you to need me forever. That is not what we're doing here. I'm not a therapist. You right. know, I want you to build the foundation and implement some of these tools into your life. And once you've done that, it's time to move on from me. Like, I actually don't want you to need me, Mm -hmm. but as long as you need me, I want to be here for you. Right, And if I can teach you how to be able to do it on your own by yourself is the whole point of what I'm doing. Right. And no parent is ready to like kick their kid out. Right. From the moment that I say, Mm -hmm. Hey, we should probably talk about have like Mm -hmm. your kid living with you. And I tell them, I said, listen, I'm not going to sit here. You know that they don't need to be in your house. Like they already know that. We're going to build the foundation and the tools for you to be okay 
with that. And that may take a few months. Right. Like we're not talking overnight, right? It might take you a while. I'm not asking you or demanding that you go do that right now. We're going to build your tools up, your understanding, change some mindset perspective. And we're going to go through some of those conversations that you may need to be having um, with them to, to, for them to be ready to move out as well. So everyone's going to get ready to, well, everyone has to be comfortable with how it, or at least right. a certain extent of comfortable. There's no there's no such thing as comfort, right? right? But but you know, the question is is are you comfortable with the way that things are going right now? Mm-hmm. Well, right. no. Well, do you want to be more comfortable, right? Like we got to get to a different level of comfort right. like you're saying. There's no comfortable, but you can't want to live this life because you're going this is going to be how you mm-hmm. live for the next 10, 15, 20, 30 mm-hmm. years. Mm-hmm. Is this how you want to live your life? Oh, a parent's God, no. job is to teach their kids how to live, right? Is to teach them how to be able to change yeah. the trash and pay bills and get a job, yeah. take a shower, brush your teeth. Like that's a parent's job. If you don't yeah. teach those things, you're kind of failing. Yeah, yeah. But your job, when they hit 18 and they're out, your job as a parent is over. Right, yeah. You know, I can't say that clearly. Your job yeah, as a parent it is, is over. It is too expensive. I You're, think still be there for support well, and that, not to hand out money and solve problems. The parenting mindset is very different than, of course, you're always going to be their parent. You're going to want to be there for them. You're going to want to support them. You're going to want what's best for them, mm-hmm. right? Um, your role as being in that parenting role is different. And we got to learn what that means, right? So you don't want to be 30 still treating them like a 15-year-old. Right. Because that's what you're going to get. Right, 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 exactly. You're going to get a 15-year-old that's 30 years old. Oh, it's okay. Sit down. Let me make you a sandwich and get you some milk. Just keep playing your video games. Yeah. Yeah. We can't. We can't do that. No, we can't do that. (laughs) And um, then, you know, the, the other question is, is who are you doing it for? Are you doing this for them or are you doing this for you? Mm -hmm. And that's a big question. And that's a hard question. Mm -hmm. That's a question that a lot of parents really hate to face, too, is who are you doing it for? Are you letting them live in your house because you think you have some control over them? Mm -hmm. Right. You think you want to, like, monitor them. Mm -hmm. At least you know where they are at night. So it's making you feel better. It's not making them. Right. It's not helping them, though. Right. It's just. And if he was on the other side of that coin trying to push them out of the house, it'd be more beneficial. With releasing control and letting them right. live their life. You're well, not going to be there forever. Right. And we frame it in such a way that it's like, I'm not kicking you out, but I am going to allow you your choices of your life. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, now it's time for you to go be an adult. Mm-hmm. And I don't think you want to live in your parents' house. So how can we get you set up to go live not in your parents' house? Because I don't know. I truly don't know any 30-year-old kid that wants to be living with their parents right well male or female you're bringing your you know significant other home to you know have dinner chill and you got to walk by your parents it sucks yeah you don't want that either Mm. so if nobody wants this situation how do we get out of it Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know and that's the goal and it's like yes it's easier yes it seems more comfortable than trying to go live out on your own but it's also helping the, the kids to build their confidence to know that they can do that as well, right? Because this is a big part of it where it's like they need the confidence to feel like they're okay. So by the parents stepping in and, you know, kind of treating them like this, it, it teaches the kids that they aren't capable of doing it without them. Right. Well, they have to start learning how to do it without them. The only way to learn how to do it without them is to do it without them. And that starts building their confidence, though. And that's what we need. And then and that's kind of how I lead with the parents where it's like, no, no, no. Tough love is not about being tough on them. It's about making decisions that are tough to do. Right. And so sometimes we do that. We can do that in a very positive way way where we're actually building their confidence we're not tearing anybody down we're not hitting people's shame buttons doing it we're going to have conversations around how do you make them feel like they're capable not make them feel like they're horrible people right Right? so it's like that's a big difference and that's a that's a slight change in the way that they approach a tough conversation of going hey i believe in you i trust in you that you are capable of going out and now it's time for me to take a step back and allow you this opportunity to go live on your own 
because I think that that's going to be the best help that I can give you. That doesn't sound like you're kicking them out, right? right it sounds right. like you're letting them fly. <laughs> yeah. So, so what do you use for social media and stuff like that for people to reach out to you if they want to hear more about it? Because, I mean, maybe there's some parents out there yeah. that's like, yo, I could use this lady's help, man. Right, yeah. This dude, this dude right here won't stop with the video games and the cookies and milk. <laughs> right, right. So can they reach um, out somehow? Absolutely. They can go, uh, they can check out, have a website. Okay. It's uh, ManeeliConsulting.com. Uh, you can also do jennifermaneely.com and it'll go to the same place. Maneely is spelled M-A-N-E-E-L-Y. Okay. So that's my website. Um, I'm pretty active, like on Facebook. Um, it's under the same name? Yeah. You can, okay. you can even friend me. Uh, if I don't, if I don't add you back, you can even send me a message. Hey, I heard about you. Mm -hmm. Um, you can add me back. I do have a TikTok, not so active on the TikTok. I also have a podcast actually as well okay it's called uh the unbreakable boundaries okay i do a lot of interviews um a lot of like recovery people but tailoring it towards more focused on like what was their family experience mm -hmm. like through their recovery journey mm -hmm. um whether it's that? good or bad <laughs> is that youtube spotify or? um you can find it anywhere okay uh it's it's on any of the channels youtube spotify uh apple itunes anywhere you listen nice. to your 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 podcast nice. you can go find that and then how about your book yeah i so i wrote this book um yeah. it's called uh yeah it's called uh dear parents strategies to help uh, your loved one through addiction okay. i wrote this in 2018 mm -hmm. um what i learned is is that it's really hard to convince anybody but especially parents to talk to a stranger about one of their most vulnerable times in their lives because right. i think you know, for parents, there's a whole lot that goes on um, in in their own mindsets, a lot of shame, a lot of embarrassment. So I'm like, well, they don't really want to. They're not just going to reach right out and talk to the stranger they've right. never met. Right. right. But I still think that they need help. They need tools. Maybe they need to get to know me a little bit. So I wrote this book to kind of give them a direction, because my biggest thing is, is when people are looking for resources, I really believe that people need to have a good place to land. Right. Right now, what they choose to do with those resources is up to them. But to have all these the people floundering, yeah, of mm -hmm. going, I don't know where to go. Well, the information and the education is important. So this is a great starting point just to kind of get to know me and also be able to kind of understand where um, your role as a parent is and hopefully to get you encourage, encourage, even if it's not with me, to go get some help. Because just like in recovery, we don't do this alone. In life, we don't do this alone. We don't get to do things alone. Uh, we need help. We need people to help guide us through different situations. I mean, the best tennis player, the best basketball player, they all have coaches, right? Uh, even if they're still even better, like the basketball players, they're going to be better than the coaches are at playing, mm -hmm. but they still need a coach mm -hmm. in certain ways. And so that's kind of the way that I look at criticism. That's kind of the way I look at this is it's like you need someone uh, to help guide you through something that you don't know how to handle and you shouldn't know how to handle. This is not an, a normal thing. Um, and and so I think that's where, you know, this book comes in is it's just a start to kind of help people feel a little bit more comfortable. I do a lot of uh, YouTube videos, resources, educational stuff around topics as well to help people because it's like, if you never reach out to me, I still want you to get help right. and have a place to land and the tools that you need. Right. Here's something you can look yeah. at and at least help, maybe help yeah. you learn something, get you through the day, yeah. remind you of what you don't want to do or be. Yeah, Yeah, that's absolutely. kind of what I base this around too, man. Because the underdog can win, right? Yeah. Like at one time, we probably thought we was never going to come out of that mess we was in. Yeah. And look at us now. You got 17 years, bro. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's very good. I'm glad you came. Well, thank you. This thank you awesome. for having me. Yeah. Absolutely. This was yeah, good, man. Awesome. I like it. We talked about a lot of different topics I haven't really touched on as much. Gave some more uh, resource to someone out there that, you know, it's in a yeah. different way. And I like yeah. that. I think that's cool. good. So, yeah, y'all drop a like, comment. You know you know how this works, man, to help this little channel out. Let her know what y'all think of her story. You know, hit the comments, ask any questions you want. And as soon as I get everything up, I'll make sure I tag your name and everything in the title so they can search for the title that way. And then uh, you know, awesome. let you know when it's up. Sounds good. Anything else you want to say before we go? 
Man, this is good. It's been great. I think that eventually, hopefully, I'm just going to put you on the spot here, and maybe me and Eric can do a podcast together. I think that would be really interesting. Okay. <laughs> right, just you and him talking back and yeah, forth? Sure. Yeah, yeah. we we'll have to see what he says. <laughs> Why not? I'd be down for that. Y'all Why can not? work it out. Y'all think you mean a mediator to, or some it, boxing We gloves may. Or? We may. I don't know. No, <laughs> I think to, we're beyond that. To, but. Yeah, right, right. We're too grown for that now. <laughs> we're too grown for that. No, I think, I, think, I think both me and Eric have done a lot of uh, healing, maybe not together, but— right. I don't think we're, uh, I have no animosity. Yeah, might be a couple of things there to close up. Yeah. Yeah. Be fun. Sure. Be fun. Sweet. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, man. That was great. Oh, 